The Development of the Tradition by Alan Armstrong, a paper read at a seminar in Bristol in 2008. Today we will be focusing upon the role of Kabbalah in the evolution of our tradition of spiritual development. Kabbalah is generally understood by scholars to be an historic system of spiritual development that emerged within medieval Judaism. Ever since its emergence, Kabbalah and its doctrines have influenced not only the mystical and spiritual life of Judaism, but also contributed to the shape and spiritual direction of some of the world's most intriguing esoteric movements, such as Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism. However, scholars apart, many serious and long-standing Kabbalists believe that Kabbalah is far older, that it is an ancient and secret doctrine of spiritual development transmitted to the people of Israel more than 3,000 years ago through the prophet and lawgiver Moses. To students of the esoteric, it is clear that the impact of Kabbalah upon the deep waters of mysticism has been both significant and extensive. Yet, less than 60 years ago, there were few books available in the English language about this obscure system of spiritual development. Indeed, before the turn of the 20th century, there were scarcely any. One, entitled The Kabbalah, its doctrines, development and literature, written by Dr. Christian Ginsberg, had been published in 1865. But it was not easily obtained until it was republished in the 20th century. It was the first objective work on the subject to be published in English since the 17th century and has been very influential in esoteric circles. Indeed, it still commands a great deal of respect today. Another, the Kabbalah Unveiled, translated from the Latin of Knorr von Rosenroth by Samuel McGregor Mathers, was published in 1887. It contains three Kabbalistic texts from the Zohar, the Lesser Holy Assembly, the Greater Holy Assembly and the Book of Concealed Mystery. Today, Mathers' book is criticised by Kabbalists and scholars alike. Nevertheless, it has been extremely influential among Western esotericists, and in some circles it is still thought to be a valuable contribution to the subject. A third, Kabbalah, the philosophical writings of Solomon ben Yehuda ibn Gabirol, was published in 1888 by an American scholar, Isaac Meyer. In the late 19th century, these works were the most readily available books in the English language concerning Kabbalah. In the first half of the 20th century, this situation changed as more books concerning this previously obscure subject became available. Many, but by no means all, were written by members of a well-known, albeit short-lived, esoteric Christian Rosicrucian order, known as the Emetic Horde of the Golden Dawn. Kabbalah was, and probably still is, fundamental to its workings. Indeed, in 1910, William Wynne Westcott, one of the founder members of this order, published a small but interesting introduction entitled The Kabbalah. Another member, Arthur Edward Waite, wrote a deeper study entitled The Doctrine and Literature of the Kabbalah, which was first published in 1902, then republished in 1929 with considerably more information. Other authors, with connections to the Emetic Order of the Golden Dawn and who published books about the Kabbalah were Henry Pullenbury, Dion Fortune and Israel Regardi. Israel Regardi's book, The Garden of Pomegranates, first published in 1932, is basically an interpretation of the Tree of Life from a magical perspective. It is still in demand in some circles. Dion Fortune's book, the Mystical Kabbalah, published in 1935, is another study of the Tree of Life and follows a broadly similar line of inquiry to that of Israel Regardi's book. During the last 50 years or so, many more books have been written in the English language about the Kabbalah. 
Yet, although this proliferation of books has vastly increased the information available, it is still probably true to say that the nature of the Kabbalah remains obscure and consequently the subject of a great deal of speculative uncertainty. And what is more, its origin remains lost in the mists of antiquity, which is perhaps as it should be. One of the most outstanding Jewish Kabbalist scholars of the 20th century, the late Gershom Sholem, stated in his book on the Kabbalah and its symbolism that the Kabbalah is literally tradition, that is, the tradition of things divine. It is the sum of Jewish mysticism. He was, of course, referring to the fact that the word Kabbalah signifies a body of knowledge passed on by oral transmission and is closely related in meaning to what we understand in English by the word tradition. Thus, there are many Kabbalahs or traditions within Judaism, but in reality, there is only one concerned with the oral transmission of the essential esoteric teachings of Jewish mysticism. It is a subject concerned, as is all true mysticism, not only with the soul's reunion with the divine, but also with the nature, source, destiny and chemistry of consciousness, and as such has been central to the development of Western esoteric thought from the earliest times. A question that arises from time to time is how does one spell the word Kabbalah? The word Kabbalah is derived from the Hebrew word Kabel, which means to receive, and there are many different ways of spelling this word in English. However, it should be noted that such variations are common as there are several different systems of transliterating Hebrew and Arabic alphabets into Roman letters. Therefore, one should not be too concerned about the correct spelling of the word in English. I shall now briefly describe the emergence and evolution of this tradition as I understand it. It is a personal view, and what follows makes no claim to be the last word on the subject. For the sake of convenience only, I shall describe it in ten stages. It could be described in more, or less, but I have chosen ten. The first stage. Among scholars, it is generally accepted that the Kabbalah emerged in southern Europe during the closing years of the 12th century particularly in the region of southern France and eastern Spain, the defining moments of this event being marked by the emergence of two literary creations. The first, the Sefahar Bahir, the Book of Brilliance, appeared in Provence in the latter half of the 12th century. It discusses, among other things, the Sephirotic Tree of Life and the 32 Paths of Wisdom. The second, the Sefahar Zohar, the Book of Splendor is a mystical commentary on the first five books of the Bible, composed, it is thought, by Moses de Leon in the late 13th century. It is generally accepted that these texts were probably in private circulation at an earlier date, but as yet there is no solid evidence to support this belief. However, in some respects, placing the origin of Kabbalah in medieval Europe is misleading as the essential ideas in Kabbalah had for many centuries previously played an important role in the life of Jewish mysticism, and that Kabbalists of all eras have consistently maintained that it was Moses himself who transmitted the essence of the Kabbalah to the people of ancient Israel. From a Kabbalistic point of view, Kabbalah is not a medieval invention, but evolved over time, beginning with Moses. Biblical historians believe he flourished during the 13th century BC. His life is described in the book of Exodus, the second book of the Old Testament, which informs us that he was born of Jewish parents and through curious circumstances was adopted and brought up as a member of the Egyptian royal family. We are further informed by both Josephus and Philo that he was instructed in all of the ancient wisdom of Egypt and furthermore, that he was also instructed in the wisdom of the surrounding nations. The book of Exodus describes how, with divine assistance, Moses emancipated the Jewish people from the yoke of Egyptian oppression and led them out of the land of Egypt 
into the wilderness, where he formed them into a nation, eventually leading them to the promised land. The significance of this achievement cannot be overestimated. However, from the point of view of this paper, there was another event of great importance. It is also written in the book of Exodus that in the third month of the people of Israel's wandering in the wilderness, Moses ascended Mount Sinai, where he received a dispensation from God for the Jewish people. This dispensation was at first transmitted to the people of Israel by Moses alone. But following divine instruction, he gathered 70 elders together and that the Lord took the spirit that was upon Moses and put it upon the 70 elders. Through this transmission, the 70 elders not only received a spiritual insight into the meaning of the Mosaic law, the Torah, which had been established for the social well-being of the people, but they also received a deeper understanding of the soul of that law, which had been established for the spirit of the people. In this revelation lies the basis of the Jewish tradition we know as Kabbalah. The second stage. The core teachings embodied in the Torah were transmitted orally from generation to generation until the early part of the 6th century BC, when Israel was invaded by the Babylonian army under the leadership of their king Nebuchadnezzar. The royal family and the ruling elite were taken into captivity along with many skilled artisans and craftsmen. Thus, in 597 BC, there began what is known as the Babylonian exile, and it is from this year the prophet Ezekiel, who was among the captives, dates his calculations. In 586 BC, Zedekiah, the new king of Judea, after taking an oath of loyalty to Nebuchadnezzar, revolted against him. The Babylonian king responded by sending an army against Jerusalem. The siege lasted 18 months, at the end of which Nebuchadnezzar ordered the city to be set on fire and the surviving inhabitants to be taken captive into Babylon. The Babylonians sacked Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, set fire to the city and carried off many thousands of people to serve as slaves in Babylon. Many avoided captivity by fleeing into other lands and living in exile. Thus, arguably, began the Diaspora, which was to have a profound influence upon the future of Judaism. The word Diaspora is a term used to describe Jewish communities living in foreign lands. The third stage. During their 70 years' captivity in Babylon, the essence of the Mosaic teachings, the Torah, which had been transmitted orally by Moses and the 70 elders, was committed to writing and gathered together in one work. This work is the written Torah and consists of the first five books of the Bible, namely Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. After the death of Nebuchadnezzar in 562 BC, Babylon fell to the expanding empire of the Persians. The reign of the Persian king Cyrus was benign, especially when compared with previous rulers, and the people of Babylon welcomed him as a liberator. In 538 BC, Cyrus allowed the people of Judea to return home and ordered the rebuilding of the Jerusalem temple. He returned the vessels that had been looted from the temple and even committed funds from his own treasury to aid the project. On their return from Babylon, the Jewish people rebuilt the temple and integrated the synagogue into their religious life, with the reading and interpretation of the Torah as its main objective. This was a very important development because it is the esoteric interpretation of the Torah and its language that constitutes the basis of the tradition we call Kabbalah, and it was in the culture and spirit of the synagogue that it acquired its principal form and nature. Furthermore, Although the people of Israel were no longer in exile, Israel remained a subject state dependent upon a succession of contemporary superpowers, eventually becoming a province 
of the Roman Empire. Unfortunately, under the rule of a succession of administrations put in place by the Romans, Israel became a hotbed of internal conflict and insurrection, and in the year 66 AD the Jews revolted against the Romans and a bloody war began. In response, Rome sent an army to restore order. By the year 68 AD, all resistance in the country had been eliminated and the Roman legions, led by Titus, laid siege to the city of Jerusalem. In the year 70 AD, they breached the walls and began a systematic demolition of the city, culminating in the burning and destruction of the temple, the focal point of Judaism, and the slaughter of many thousands of the inhabitants. Those spared from death were taken as slaves or sent to the arena. Others fled abroad, seeking refuge in the settlements of the diaspora. From that time, the Jews were a dispersed people, a nation without a state and a religion without a temple. Fortunately, they were able to establish communities in the diaspora and preserve their identity in their religion. The fourth state. The Jews of the Diaspora were compelled by circumstance to adapt to the cultural influences of the Greco-Roman world, whose major centres of civilization had become a fusion of many different cultures. This they did, and in spite of all obstacles, they successfully established communities throughout the Mediterranean world. Indeed, ancient writers such as Josephus and Tacitus record that the Diaspora Jews were both numerous and prosperous. This situation had previously been facilitated by Alexander the Great more than three centuries earlier, when he and his army opened up the world that lay beyond the Mediterranean civilization. Furthermore, in the middle of the 4th century BC, Alexander founded the celebrated city of Alexandria on the northern coast of Egypt. In this great city, religions and mystery schools from many different cultures came and established themselves, exchanging ideas and teachings, competing, comparing and exploring new avenues of thought. In this vibrant city, the Jews established a community of considerable size and strength. Indeed, the dispersed community of Judaism took full advantage of the opportunities presented by Alexander and over the course of time they built thriving communities in almost every city of the Roman Empire. In the early years of the 3rd century BC, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, the Torah, were translated, so it is said, into the Greek language by 70 Jewish scholars. According to the apocryphal letter of Aristeas, a Greek poet of the 2nd century BC, Six elders from each of the twelve tribes of Israel were invited to Alexandria by Ptolemy II to translate the Mosaic books into Greek. Over the course of the next 200 years or more, this work, known as the Septuagint, eventually encompassed the rest of the Old Testament as well as other non-canonical books. Now the Jews of the Diaspora had a reputation for being zealous missionaries, who sought and often succeeded in converting Gentiles to their faith. However, the influence went both ways. Greek thought also influenced and modified the religious practices of the Diaspora. Indeed, a great deal of the wisdom teaching was inspired by the Greeks and had a profound effect upon the esoteric understanding of the Jewish scriptures. Furthermore, many Diaspora synagogues, particularly in Alexandria, held their services in the Greek language. However, after the Great Dispersion in AD 70, the Jews were without a spiritual or political centre for a considerable time. Rabbinical influences grew slowly, and the Talmud, which is a collection of commentaries concerning the regulation and administration of Jewish law, evolved slowly between the 2nd and 5th centuries AD, a period of some 400 years or more. Inevitably, then, the beliefs of the people of the Diaspora were influenced in varying degrees by the cultural environment they found themselves in and were especially influenced by Greek thought, 
particularly that of Pythagoras, Plato and the Academy. It is in such an environment that the Sefer Yetzira, the Book of Creation, is believed to have first emerged. It is a short treatise on ancient cosmology expressed in a Jewish framework. There are several versions of it available in English. It is accepted by most Kabbalistic scholars as being the earliest and most important work extant on the subject of Kabbalah. Inevitably, there are different opinions concerning both its authorship and the date it was written. Traditionally, it was attributed to Abraham himself. Others think it a medieval creation. Gershom Sholem argues that it was probably composed in Palestine between the 2nd and 4th centuries AD, while Arya Kaplan suggests that it existed in its present form as early as 204 AD. The fifth stage. Almost 1700 years ago, in the year 315, the Emperor Constantine transformed the world when he issued an edict known as the Edict of Milan, which legitimised the long-persecuted Christian faith. Some years later, in 323, after defeating Licinius, the Emperor of the East, Constantine gave Christianity preferential status in the Empire. Two years later, in 325, he convened the Council of Nicaea to decide upon a theological dispute concerning the essence and nature of Jesus Christ and to determine the order and organisation of the Church. Thus, over the course of his reign, Constantine set in motion a series of events that eventually led to the demise of the old religions and the closing of the mystery schools. In the year 330, he transferred his court to Constantinople, his name for the rebuilt city of Byzantium. We now know it as Istanbul. There, in Constantinople, his administration was essentially a Christian administration that over the course of time inaugurated an increasingly hostile policy towards paganism, a policy maintained during the reign of his son Constantine II, who brought more pressure to bear against pagans. In 339, Jews were forbidden to own Christian slaves, and the death penalty was instituted for those who took the Jewish faith. Marriages between Jews and Christians were forbidden on pain of death for any Jew who transgressed this law. As time passed, religions such as Judaism were either forced underground to practice in secret or to move to areas beyond the immediate influence of the administration. After the year 391, during the reign of Theodosius I, Christianity became the official state religion and all other forms of religious expression were restricted and penalised within the empire. However, the core spiritual teachings and philosophy of the ancient world did not completely disappear. Rather, they were quietly translated and assimilated into Christian thought and practice by such men as Clement of Alexandria, Oregon, the desert monastics of Egypt, St. Augustine and the Pseudo-Dionysus. Indeed, the Christian philosophers of the 3rd and 4th centuries completely took over the pervasive Neoplatonic system whose origin is attributed to the 3rd century Greek philosopher Plotinus and absorbed it into the growing intellectual framework of the Church. The essence of Plotinus' teachings proposes three principal modes of being to which he applies the term hypostasis. The hierarchy of the hypostasis, as defined by Plotinus, was adapted to express the co-equal nature of the Christian trinity of God as Father, Son and Holy Spirit, and the Platonic world of ideas was integrated into the one supreme divine nature itself. This was clearly reflected in the ascetic disciplines of the Christian communities, particularly in the Levantine deserts, where purification was sought not by separation but through unification, the unification of the body, soul and spirit in Christ, which differed radically from the asceticism generally practised in the Greco-Roman world 
which involved the use of psycho-spiritual processes designed to separate the soul from the body and its negative influence. The influence of Greco-Roman thought, particularly Neoplatonism, also had a powerful effect upon the Jews of the Diaspora. The essence of Plotinus's teaching proposes three principal modes of being, to which he applies the term hypostasis. The first he defines as the one, which is a term that describes the prime source and principle of all being, the very ground of existence. The second he calls the divine nous, or divine mind, in which exists the archetypal ideas and prototypes of all creation. The third, proceeding from the divine nous, he called the world soul, which gives form to the archetypal ideas contained in the divine nous. Below the world soul was to be found the realm of nature, which constitutes the outer life of the world soul. In Neoplatonic terms, the world soul consists of two parts. First, a higher celestial part through which it contemplates the divine nous. And second, a lower terrestrial part through which it generates the material cosmos according to the archetypal model contained within the divine nous. Human souls proceed from the world soul, and like the world soul, may also be subdivided into two or more parts, because a human being, he taught, is a microcosm, wherein the principles of the hypostasis are reflected as spirit, soul and body. Below the sphere of the soul lies the material world, in which the soul's conjunction with matter and a material body takes place and which Plotinus taught was a fall or descent from a higher state of being. It is from this fall or descent that the soul seeks redemption, and to which Plotinus devotes much of his attention. As I understand it, Plotinus's model of the cosmos is significant, in that he describes in literal terms what previously had been taught through metaphor and allegory, and only experienced by the initiate, during the celebration of the mysteries, at the centre of which, with all of its pomp, ceremonial and drama, the consciousness of the initiate would have been elevated through the use of evocative prayer to experience the world soul in the form of Demeter, and then, after a different fashion, to experience the divine nous in the form of Dionysus. Plotinus believed that it was possible for individual souls, through the practice of contemplation, to ascend to the level of the divine nous, and there, in spiritual union, be absorbed back into the One. He describes the most important objectives of the mystery schools to be the direct experience of and union with divinity. This, as I understand it, consists of two parts. The first part, which may be thought of as the lesser mysteries, which are concerned with the separation of the soul from the carnal nature of the physical body. The second part may be described as the greater mysteries, which are concerned with the elevation of the soul beyond the reactive nature of the psychic world into the presence of the divine. Much of Plotinus's thought is to be seen in later Kabbalistic thinking. The sixth stage. During the second, third and fourth centuries, the Jewish people consolidated their faith in the administration of the rabbis, who were the successors to the Pharisees, and in the Talmud, which became the cultural benchmark for all Jews. The Talmud began to evolve in second century Palestine, when the oral teachings of the Jewish people were committed to writing. These teachings consisted of two parts. Firstly, the Halakha, which embodies religious rites and ceremonies, civil and criminal law, and jurisprudence in general. Secondly, the Haggadah, which consists of the thoughts, hopes, feelings and wishes of the Jewish people as expressed in the customs, myths, parables, proverbs and stories of the Torah. The arrangement of this immense amount of material took two forms. The first, known as the Mishnah, is a compilation of laws and regulations. The second, known as the Midrash, is a collection of commentaries on and discussions about the books of the Torah. 
it is a valuable source of spiritual and metaphysical speculation that has ever been central to Kabbalism. The Mishnah was taken from Palestine to Babylon, where it was taught and explained in the schools founded there by the Palestinian Jews. These explanations, known as Gemara, consist of the records of discussions that took place in the Palestinian schools over the succeeding three centuries. The Gemara is a treasure house of everything that the most distinguished minds of Judaism of the period spoke, thought, felt, experienced and knew. The Babylonian Gemara was completed about 500 AD. The Mishnah and the Gemara together form the Talmud, and although not strictly a law book, the Talmud was eventually adopted as the only authority in matters of religious law, and like the Mishnah some 300 years previously, became the subject of great study and exposition. I labour this point to stress how important the Talmud and the commentaries that form the Midrash were to the Jewish people subsequent to the Roman destruction of Jerusalem, and that they were fundamental to the development of Kabbalism. The seventh stage. For the Jews, the rise of Islam in the seventh century was in some ways a stroke of good fortune. Islam, particularly in its early phase, was tolerant of other belief systems, including Judaism, and absorbed and nurtured much of the philosophy and science of the ancient world, particularly that of the Greeks. Thus, by the late 7th century, the traditional Greco-Roman centres of learning, such as Athens and Alexandria, had been eclipsed by the new centres of learning emerging in Islam, centres such as Damascus, Cairo and Baghdad. Free from the institutional prejudice of the Christian administration of the Byzantine Empire, the Jews were initially able to thrive under Islamic rule. With the fall of the Roman Empire in the 5th century, civilization in Western Europe rapidly declined and entered a long period of ignorance, war, poverty and disease. The social structure of Roman civilization was torn apart by invasion from without, and civil conflicts within. Education and the arts fell by the wayside to be maintained only by the church. Whilst Western Europe lay in the grip of these dark ages, the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire, centred around the city and culture of Constantinople, flourished. By the 6th century, it had become the centre of civilization in a fractured Roman Empire and was to remain an important centre of the civilised world until 1453 when it fell to the Turks. However, there were other civilised areas in Western Europe, areas that were safe havens for the tradition. One such region was the Moorish territories in Spain. From the middle of the 8th until the middle of the 11th century, the Moors, under their rulers the Caliphs, ruled much of Spain from their capital Cordova. Their tolerant rule ensured a fruitful and luxuriant lifestyle for Muslim, Jew and Christian alike. Indeed, their various communities formed an important part of the general economy. Together, they constituted the principal channel through which the culture and philosophy of ancient Greece passed into the Latin world. This was particularly so in the bloody years of the late 12th century, when the tolerant rule of the Caliphs was overturned by the fierce Berbers of the Atlas Mountains. The violent intolerance of these invaders drove many scholars and artisans from these communities into the Christian territories. The regions of Provence and Languedoc were also safe havens that tolerated different cultures and philosophies, making southern France an oasis of artistic and scientific excellence. Provence supported not only the Cathars, a dualist form of Christianity that flourished in parts of Western Europe during the 12th and 13th centuries, particularly in the regions of Provence and Languedoc but also a large international community of Jews, Arabs, Greeks, Spaniards, Italians and East Europeans, 
filling the intellectual environment with a dynamic mixture of Neoplatonism, dualism and the esoteric teachings of Judaism, Christianity and Islam. Here, the grey legends and the poetry of the troubadours reach their zenith and according to Sholom, the Kabbalah, as understood in modern terms, was born. The Eighth Stage From the beginning of the 13th century, Kabbalism began to emerge in Europe as a distinct mystical discipline, attaining considerable prominence in southern France and Spain. It was in Provence during the late 12th century that the Sefer HaBahir, the Book of Brilliance, first made its appearance. It is attributed to Rabbi Nehunya ben ha Kana, the master of a first century esoteric school in Palestine. However, its precise origin and authorship remains unknown. It was out of this fertile hothouse of mystical speculation that not only the Bahir but also the Zohar, the Book of Splendor, emerged. When the Roman Empire collapsed in the 5th century, Western and Eastern Europe went their separate ways, only to come together again in the centuries of the Crusades, that's the 11th to the 13th centuries. Because of them, West European culture re-established its connection with the Eastern Empire and beyond. Through this contact, a cultural renaissance took place that was to transform our world. This renaissance, the high point of which we identify with 15th century Florence, was a revival of classical Greco-Roman culture. Although it was the fall of Constantinople in 1453 that precipitated the high point of the Renaissance, with its epicentre being the city of Florence, where, under the patronage of the Medici family, art, science, philosophy and even religious speculation, inspired by the ancient world of Greece and Rome, as well as the contemporary cultures of Byzantium and Islam, flourished. A significant figure in this amazing period was Marsilio Ficino, who, with the support of Cosimo de' Medici, established the Platonic Academy of Florence. As its name implies, it was dedicated to the study and translation of the works of Plato and other members of the Academy of Athens. Ficino not only translated into Latin the works of Plato, but also the works of Plotinus, Porphyry, Iamblichus and Proclus, making these classics of the ancient world available for the first time in centuries to Western readers. In doing so, Ficino and other members of the Academy created the conditions by which the study of esoteric Judaism, that is the Kabbalah, could be safely embraced in a sympathetic manner. It was in this environment that the secret teachings of the Jewish mystics, the Kabbalists, entered upon the Christian world stage. The Ninth Part If Ficino was central to the renewal of interest in the classical world of ancient Greece and Rome, then Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, a member of the Academy and perhaps Ficino's most notable student, was the key figure in drawing esoteric Judaic thought in the form of Kabbalah into the social limelight of Renaissance culture. His major work, 900 Conclusions, published in 1486, attempted to synthesise the mystical doctrines of Christianity with those of Judaism and Islam. 72 of these conclusions were derived from Kabbalistic sources. Unfortunately, his publication brought him into conflict with the church authorities. Mirandola is also thought to have influenced Archangelus of Verganova, whose writings attempted to demonstrate how much Jewish traditions confirmed Christian traditions, and Johann Reuchlin, the German humanist, whose book, De Art Kabbalistica, published in 1517, is thought by some to be the beginning of Christian Kabbalah. On the surface, Reuchlin's work inclined towards the magical applications of Kabbalah and is thought to have gratefully influenced the writings of Johann Trithmius, a 15th century Benedictine abbot and student of magic who was very influential in his day 
and the equally influential Enrique Cornelius Agrippa. Both were deeply influenced by Kabbalah and both passed on their knowledge through their publications. In medieval Europe, magic had an irresistible attraction for many of the intelligentsia and the magical dimensions of Kabbalah became a major focal point of study. For many, the legitimate study of natural magic, the science of the day, was greatly reinforced by the study of Kabbalah. But for others, the main attraction was the application of Kabbalah to Goetic or Black Magic and to Theurgy, the divine or transcendental magic. This obsession for magical knowledge and the control of the cosmos eventually pushed Kabbalah into the category of rejected knowledge from which it has never escaped. Yet in truth, Kabbalah has little to do with magic and the true Kabbalist is neither a magician nor seeks to become a magician. It may be difficult for an impartial observer to grasp the significance of this point, but it may become clear if one understands that to the Kabbalist, the practical application of Kabbalah are concerned only with the divine names of God as derived from the scriptures and their mysterious workings in the dynamic meditations of the Kabbalist. Thus to engage with the divine names is to engage in a spiritual rather than a magical process. To the Kabbalists such processes are geared only to the regeneration of the soul, not to self-elevation, aggrandizement or for intellectual curiosity. In the midst of the Renaissance a body of work was published that has since mystified Jew and non-Jew alike. This body of work is called the Zohar otherwise known as the Book of Splendours. The Zohar is the definitive work of Kabbalistic mysticism compiled, or perhaps composed, by Rabbi Moses de Leon in Spain during the late 13th century. For many years, it was generally believed that the Zohar was the work of Rabbi Simeon ben Yohai, a legendary figure of immense importance to the tradition. Rabbi Simeon lived in 1st century Palestine, and according to legend, he, with his son, retired into a secret cave for more than a dozen years, and in this cave the Zohar was written. However attractive the legend may be, the Zohar has been identified as the work of Rabbi Moses de Leon, who lived and worked in Spain in the latter part of the 13th century. In reality, it is not a single unified work, but is rather a great literary anthology, consisting of several books, which in published editions are generally divided into five parts, and consist of esoteric commentaries and homiletics upon the Pentateuch and Jewish life in relation to the Jewish scriptures. These parts are 1. Genesis, 2. Exodus, 3. The rest of the Pentateuch, 4. The Arrangements, and 5. The New Zohar. The Zohar was first printed in Hebrew in 1558-1560 as a three-volume edition in Mantua. At the same time, a one-volume edition was published in Cremona. From the latter part of the 16th century onward, various translations appeared in both manuscript and printed form. However, the most significant translation was probably that of Christian Nor von Rosenroth, a 17th century German Kabbalist who translated sections of the Zohar into Latin. This translation had a tremendous influence on Western thought. In fact, it was the main source of information about the Zohar in cultured European circles until the beginning of the 20th century. The Tenth Part It could be argued that the Florentine Renaissance inspired the Reformation the religious upheaval that commenced in earnest during the early years of the 16th century, and after a long and bloody conflict, eventually freed the Christian nations of Western Europe from the decadent administration of Roman theocracy, which had, for the best part of a thousand years, endeavoured to suppress any religious views differing from the Orthodox. Consequently, throughout the 16th and 17th centuries, 
This new freedom inspired in educated circles a willingness to explore the spiritual teachings and philosophy of different religions. This also included esoteric Judaism, particularly in the form of Kabbalah, and so contributed in no small measure to a great flowering of spiritual thought. Influential figures such as Giorgio Francesco, Guillaume Postel, Robert Flood, Cornelius Agrippa, Athanasius Kircher, Jakob Burma, Noah von Rosenroth, William Blake, Jane Led, Henry Moore, Isaac Newton, William Law, Johann Valentin Andrea, Giordano Bruno and Elias Ashmole were all to some extent influenced by Kabbalistic thought. These and others like them embodied the many different expressions of this ancient tradition of spiritual evolution. This tradition, although not unique to Judaism, is most notably defined in the Jewish esoteric teachings that fall under the heading of Kabbalah. Why this is so is difficult to answer, as there are many factors involved, too many to deal with in this paper. However, one factor worth considering is the collapse of a unified church in the 16th century. This collapse, which we call the Reformation, also brought about the destruction of a network of monastic houses through which a spiritual tradition, a tradition that had been in every way a secret tradition, had been disseminated. History demonstrates clearly that many monastic houses had become moribund, decadent or even depraved by the middle of the second millennium. Yet there were some monastic houses that had quietly maintained the ancient ways of a secret tradition of spiritual development hints of which may be seen in the speculative explorations that seem to be common to medieval monastic houses. I refer you to Lynn Thorndike's History of Magic and Experimental Science, the first two volumes of which are delightfully suggestive. In all probability, the roots of this lost tradition are no different to the tradition known as Kabbalah, a fusion of late Stoic, Neoplatonic and Judaic thought dependent upon the symbolic and allegorical interpretation of scripture, combined with psycho-spiritual dynamic practices involving ceremonial, asceticism and meditation. In Christian terms, this tradition derives more from the desert monks of Egypt and Palestine than from rabbinic sources although it must be acknowledged that during the 3rd and 4th centuries there was a significant interaction between the rabbinic schools of Palestine and Christian communities in that region, both of which drew heavily from Greek thought. A great deal of our understanding about the rules and practices of these various communities has come down to us through the writings of contemporaries such as the anchorite Evagrius of Pontus, in the 4th century, Evagrius spent the majority of his years among the desert monks, engaging in the ascetic life. He was highly regarded in his day, with a reputation for great wisdom and piety. He was also an enthusiastic follower of Oregon, as were many of the desert monks. Inevitably, Evagrius, a prodigious and acclaimed writer, eventually fell foul of the church for his adherence to the teachings of Oregon. His writings were, nevertheless, used by John Cassian in the opening years of the 5th century as a basis for introducing Egyptian monasticism into Western Europe. Cassian had spent years in a monastic community in Palestine before travelling to Egypt, where he dwelt for a considerable time among the desert monks, collecting and recording information about the ascetic life and rule of the desert fathers. In 415, he established two monastic houses near Marseille, one for men and one for women. He instituted a rule for both based upon his experience in Egypt, upon the writings of Evagrius. In the 6th century, St. Benedict, drawing on the work of Cassian and through him upon Evagrius, Oregon and the legacy of the Desert Fathers and their communities, established what was to be the most successful rule for a monastic community. It is a rule that has been adapted time and time again by communities of spirituals ever since. Thus, the tradition quietly passed into Western culture, 
wherein it was nurtured to a greater or lesser degree, depending on prevailing circumstances, for a thousand years or more, until the reformation of a decadent theocracy arguably threw out the baby with the bathwater. The Reformation was followed by the so-called Enlightenment and the enslavement of reason and logic to the sarcophagus of the world of the senses. The rest, as they say, is history. Finally, the most remarkable thing about the Kabbalah is not so much that it is a tradition of spiritual development, that's an established fact that does not require my testimonial, but that during the second millennium the tradition in the form of Kabbalah motivated and continues to motivate thoughtful people towards the realization that within their own culture may be found the very same tradition of spiritual insight and development. It is a tradition that belongs to the world, not just to small parts of it. Those who understood this have sought to rekindle the flames of the spiritual quest in the materially obsessive soul of our culture. They have left us a wonderful legacy. But as ever, few are prepared to seek it, and fewer still to understand it. Even so, I am confident that the tradition, beautifully embodied in the Kabbalah, will continue to grow, even if it is in the quiet backwaters of the world. Thank you.